It's a beautiful story that happened. It's got tragedy as well. It was during the Holocaust. And one of these trains, these cattle cars, where they would squish 100, 200 people. You couldn't breathe. They didn't give you food. They didn't give you a drink. People were dying standing up. There was no room to go to the bath. There was no bathroom there. It was soiled and smelly and hot and dehydrated. Awful. And then when they came out, what's their reward? Gas chamber crematorium. It was one of these trains that stopped and the Nazis opened the doors and they were going to have a death march to the camp. It didn't stop in the camp itself. It stopped right outside of the camp. And the villagers, these Polish villagers, they were there, they were watching and then all the Jews who were still alive, they came out and the Nazis, to have fun, the Nazis called out to all of the Polish villagers, whoever wants to come, Take whatever you want. Where the Jews are going, there's nothing there for them. They're not going to need any of it. Whatever you see, just take it. And these Goyim, they went to the Yidden and they began to rip at them, ripping the watches off their wrists and the rings off of their fingers. Hopping, hopping, hopping. No Rachmanus. And there was this one lady and the lady was wearing a fur coat It was a beautiful, luxurious, expensive fur coat. And these two Polish ladies, they see it at the same moment. And they go barreling into her and they knock her over. She falls to the ground. She's already weak. That's her her prized possession, her fur coat. And these two ladies, they grab it and they want to fight over it. And they're going through the pockets. And all of a sudden, in one of the pockets they feel something moving. And they go off to the side and they realize that in the pocket of one of these coats was a little baby. So one of the Polish women who had knocked down this Jewish lady, she had never had children. She always wanted. So she said to the other lady, I'll tell you what, you keep the fur coat There was even money in the fur coat. You keep all of that. Let me have the baby. And the other lady said, I don't want a Jewish baby. I don't want any baby. Take the baby. I'll take take the coat. And that's it. And this lady, this, this, this Polish lady takes the baby, brings to her house, and decides she's never going to tell her that she's a Jewish girl. She's going to bring her up. She's a newborn, a tiny little baby. She's going to bring up this baby as her daughter. And this baby had this beautiful necklace, mug and dove, very beautifully crafted, interesting. And she took that mug and dove and she hid it in her drawer that this girl should never know that she was Jewish. And she called this girl... Hannah. And Hannah was a very bright, precocious young, young lady. When she was a young child, she proved herself to be very smart. And as she got older, she enrolled in medical school. And she became a young female doctor that was rare in Poland. Very smart, very clever, very becoming. One day she's called home from the hospital. Please, your mother is very, very ill. And she cries at her mother's bedside as her mother passes away, her Polish mother. A week after her mother passed away, she's at home and she's mourning for her mother when there's a knock at the door. And a lady comes, another Polish lady. She says, hello, you're the daughter. I need to tell you something. That was not your mother. That really wasn't. What do you mean? Of course that was my mother. No, it wasn't. Let me tell you the story. Your mother and I saw the Jews being taken out. There was this fur coat. I kept the coat. She kept you. Hannah said, impossible. That's not true. That's my mother. No, it's really not. I was there. I saw you as a child. You know, when you were grabbed, There was even a Jewish star that you were wearing. I bet 
Your mother didn't throw it out. It's probably somewhere in her possessions. And they went through all of her possessions. And sure enough, in the back of one of the drawers, they found a little a necklace big enough for a little baby with a beautiful mug and dove on it. And Hannah was shocked. She was shocked. I'm Jewish? What does that mean? I don't even know. And so she began learning a little bit more about it very confused. Her mother never told her. She felt a sense of betrayal that her mother never said anything. One day, she takes her money and she vacations in France. And she's walking through the streets of Paris and she sees two young Chabad Bachram and they're putting tefillin on people. And she goes over to them and she says, I have an interesting story. I was a war baby. I found out I'm Jewish. I don't know what to do with that information. And the Bachram said, we don't either know. But probably the Lubavitch Rebbe, he'll know what to do with it. Why don't you write him a letter? So she wrote a letter to the Lubavitch Rebbe and the Rebbe writes back, you said you're a pediatrician. Here's what I recommend. I recommend that you go to Eretz Israel, You move there. Learn about your roots in Eretz Israel. They can use more pediatricians, doctors to take care of children. Go there. And this became the great question in her mind. If I say yes, I am denying my childhood. I am denying how I grew up. She grew up going to church with her religious Polish mother. Can I possibly say yes to this rabbi from New York that I never even met? And she thought about it. She meditated on it. And then eventually she said, Hineni, I want to learn who I am. I want to learn who my parents were, what they believed, where I come from. And she bought a plane ticket and she moved to Eretz Israel. And she learned more and more about her Yiddishkeit. She got a job in Hadassah in Kerem as a pediatrician. She worked with young children. And the entire time she learned more. And eventually she married a nice Jewish young Israeli. And they built a house together, a home together. And a few years later, there was a bomb in a pizza shop, in the Subaru pizza shop, if you may remember, a devastating bomb, many killed, the windows bloodied with Yiddish blood, and children who came with their parents to buy a slice of pizza, dead on the floor. And some of those children that were badly injured were brought to different hospitals and some of those children ended up in Hadassah in Kerem. And that's where Hannah was a doctor and she began to treat these children. Some of them were just suffering from shock. Some of them had wounds. They need stitches. They needed glass taken out of their face and their hands and their arms. And as she's trying to go from one child to the next, calming down the situation, an old man comes in. <coughs> And the old man is screaming a name. And he's, he's screaming. And he says, please, please help me find my Goldie. Where's Goldie? Help me find my Goldie. So the doctors, including Hannah, she came out. And, okay, we'll help you. Okay, absolutely. Who is Goldie? She says, Goldie, Goldie's my granddaughter. Help me find her. Okay, we'll find her. And finally, one of the kids was crying with tears streaming down her face face black from the explosion. Hannah takes her, wipes, wipes off the dirt and says, is this your Goldie? And he says, yes, Goldie, you're alive. You made it. I was so worried. And he grabs his granddaughter and he hugs her and he kisses her. And as he's hugging her, Hannah's standing and he's watch, she's watching and she's so emotional. And all of a sudden, she sees little Goldie is wearing a necklace and she says to the grandfather, where is that from that's so unique? I've seen this before. 
And the grandfather says, impossible. You've never seen this before. You see, I'm a goldsmith and I made this necklace. I made two of them for my two daughters. One of my daughters died in the Holocaust and the other daughter moved to Eretz Israel. And this is that daughter's, this is that daughter's daughter. Goldie is the daughter and she had given the necklace that I made for her to her daughter. And Hannah reaches to her neck and she pulls out the identical mug and David and she puts it next to Goldie's and then she looks at her father and she says, Abba, Ata Abba Shali. And he looks at the gold necklace and he breaks down crying like a baby. He can't believe it. He had a different name for her, but he understood this was her daughter. This was his daughter. He recognized her facial features and they hug and they kiss. And the power of yes reunited a father and a daughter. My friends, we have opportunities to grow like nobody has. We have this vehicle called Care of Tuni. We have our families and our wives and our husbands that encourage us, that want to see the best in us. Don't be shy. Don't be bashful. The word yes is waiting for you. Hineni, when we finish this beautiful convention, we come home, immediately look for opportunities to say yes. But as is Hashem, whether that means to start Tafyomi or to start learning with the Kindalach or to be more Makbin and Tzniyos or Shmir Seinayim, say the magic word yes. Hineni. You're going to see you and I, Kaddish Baruch Hu, will be yachtov together throughout this world. Each one of you saying yes, and Hashem will listen to your tefillahs, and Hashem will answer yes also.